disruptors and curious minds. Welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson, futurist, builder at the intersection of music, tech, and story. Along with me is a very talented writer, lore creator, sense maker from the mountains of France, Mr. Mark Fielding. Welcome, sir. How are you? Hi, Jeremy. I'm awesome. Thank you. Yeah, disruptors and curious minds are our, our, our official tagline. Love it. Um, yeah, it's been that's, um, that's actually big news. We had a we had a, a WhatsApp message about that today. Uh, it's been solidified, voted upon, so you will start seeing it on our site and other deliverables. Yeah, so. if we say disruptors and curious minds, we're talking to the thinking on paper audience. It's been a great week for me. Like you mentioned, I've been doing some law writing, and this week, the artwork for some of these characters for this computer game I've been writing has started to be developed. So I'm seeing my my ideas taking shape, which is incredible. Um, but, uh, I've done, yeah, a lot of work, did some technical writing for blockchain this week. I've been writing about, um, education and AR and the metaverse for culture three for our friends at culture three. So oh, yeah. that's yeah. been kind of channeling my, what's his name? I never get it's like Yuval Noah Harari, like thinking about education, oh, which is very, and all that. Yep. yeah, mm -hmm. which is very pertinent for our guest today, but I actually also, before that, I did my onboarding with Ripple this week, our sponsors. Amazing. Perfect segue, Mark. Yeah. Uh, so we want to give a shout out to uh, Dixie and Ray and the whole team at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform. If you're a large organization looking for some marketing superpowers, they are a great platform and resource for you to bring in project-based work, but also find your next superstar uh so uh w-r-i-p-p-l-e.com you can actually find mark and myself or soon to be mark and myself yeah. on that platform should you need the work that we do so uh we're super happy to be um uh i guess supported by an organization that we actually do some work with right and it's not just this this ad thing we're actually part of what they're doing and really believe in their mission as well so yeah. uh check them out dixie's always in the thread if you have questions about that so let's talk about That's where great. we're headed today. You know, we're always at the- at Where the, are we heading today, Jeremy? It's a great question. Let's see if we can pull it off. So, so part of what we try to do, right, is explore this intersection between culture and emerging tech. I think our guest today is probably one of the, one of the most perfect uh, folks to sit, that sits at that intersection, like literally every day. Um, and we want to talk about uh, things like accessibility of technology, right? We want to talk about not just accessibility of tech for the people consuming the content, but the people actually creating the content, right? And there are obvious mismatches between, you know, the availability of that and, and to who it's available. Um, and then secondly, kind of this idea of telling these amazing stories uh, from, from the past that actually can be brought to new life using tech in a way that generates emotion and empathy and all of those things in super meaningful ways. Yeah. Um, a, how'd I do? Much more, how'd on I a do? much more emotional, visceral level, if you're, if those stories are immersive, if you're part of them, if you can interact with the people and the places and the time, there's going to be more of a learning experience, but also more of a emotional resonance, isn't there? So yeah, it's well explained. Absolutely. Without further ado, we are super excited to to bring on our guest, a fellow Atlantan. So the Atlanta community has now on, outnumbered the 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 French Alps. Um, Yolanda Barton, welcome to the show. So great to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, Jeremy and Mark. Thank you for the introduction. Amazing. So let's let's jump in. I, I know there are a lot of really cool threads we want to we want to explore, but why don't you give us a little bit on your background as it relates to how you landed in this amazingly compelling and interesting intersection of of culture and emerging tech? Let's let's talk about that first. Yeah, sure, no problem. I'm originally born and raised in Seattle, and for most people that um, live there today, they don't even realize that a lot of music legacies and amazing talent came from that city, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Quincy Jones launched his career and was raised there. There's there's a long list of names. And you got to ask yourself how a city like that has birthed so much. There you go. So much Great amazing work. talent and um, genius in that space. And 
I was raised around it. So I feel really lucky and proud to be a part of that history. But like most people, I left for a very long time after college and lived my adult years other places. And then as an adult, I wanted to bring my kids back there, except I couldn't find the community that I came from. And I really couldn't find a trace of that history to share with them. So I was really in a mad race to find out what I could do to urgently preserve what I felt like was vanishing. And that's how I joined tech. That's how tech became useful because it was about preserving history and preserving legacy so that no matter who lives in those spaces, people can still connect to that legacy and be inspired by it. So we don't lose the opportunity to connect with our past. And Brett, what I just feel so, like that can just, be. just so we can like trace your, your, your journey in this, what year was this? 2016 through 2019. Um, and then 2019, I got the chance to speak at Oculus headquarters to leadership about my vision for immersive tech, specifically with them virtual reality. And then they invited me to Oculus Launchpad. And that was great because what that did was gave me a chance to stop talking about the theory of the work, right? Now let's build the application. And so I built an amazing team and we created an immersive experience that recreated the neighborhood that I'm from, the Central District of Seattle. And we built an opportunity to preserve Jimi Hendrix legacy, Quincy Jones, Ray Charles, Ernestine Anderson, Sir mix -a -Lot. I mean, that list is long, but now people can experience that and, and visit this neighborhood. Um, so we're working on completing that now. And we're excited that Oculus will be making an announcement that our prototype won the competition and we're ready to share this vision and the opportunity to preserve stories and history for everyone to experience. To, to, now, I, I see why you two know each other and have worked together because I think probably what you just said is music to Jeremy's ears. Um, yeah. Well, well played, Mark. Well played. Yeah. yeah the, <laughs> what, two, two points or one point and then one question for you, Yolanda. Sure. The, the first point is, you know, this congrats on, on making that transition between a uh, beautiful idea in execution because that is often the most difficult piece of the puzzle to, 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 to my grandfather used to say, land, land the damn plane already. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of like you, you took it, you figured out a way to execute. So congrats to that uh, question you, related to it. When you were at Oculus and you were presenting um, your vision, your, your story, what you thought your strategy what do you think resonated with them the most to be like, man, we got to have Yolanda in this incubator? You know, I really want to say it's the creators more than anything, like the developers, the people who are building this landscape and working diligently every day, creating towards this future. They also want to be inspired. They also want to feel like there's something they connect to. So I'm constantly seeing from the people who are developers, especially in Launchpad, all of those developers like actually voted me number one on the leadership board, which says what? Like I'm the other in, in every industry that I'm in. I don't fall into the gamer community as much. I'm in the other category. And sometimes my name is the only one there. So for them to select me, choose me, vote me into the number one spot um, for that leadership board shows that they see the power of doing something different and bringing something new to the table. I do think that a lot of developers are bored and they want to create things that will resonate with humanity. They want to feel connected to this kind of experience. And we just need to give people more opportunities to build. Yeah, I think that's quite a, a, a powerful observation that developers do want something more than what their their bread and butter is telling them to do. Yeah. yeah. Use, their, use your powers for good kind of thing, right? There's always yeah. that you know, always that mission. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, stoke the fires a little bit uh, related to you. So we're, we're talking about development. There are a couple of uh, main development engines that are out there. There's there's Unreal, there's Unity. Mm -hmm. um, and Unity has been in the news uh, quite a bit lately yes. for, um, I mean, I don't think it's wrong to to try and monetize your platform, but how, how are you seeing what is happening with Unity resonate in the developer community? You know, I I'm hearing a lot from all sides of it, right? And Unity is the tool that we used also, like we built our experience on the Quest. And so we primarily use Unity as well. I think communication is important and connecting with the community that you're serving is really important to understand um, what challenges you can create and what challenges you can alleviate. And that is sort of like 
part of what I think the conversation that needs to take place is, is what is it that you need to continue to be such a great tool for people to use? And what do the people you're serving need? And what are the audiences that are just beginning? Like, don't forget about the beginners. We don't, we don't talk enough about the people who are just stepping foot in this industry and are just learning these tools. And what do they need to be successful? Right. So there's so many different sides of that conversation. Um, and we could be here for two days having it. Totally. Um, but I do think some important conversations need to take place. And it there has to be a balance in meeting everyone's needs. And you're right, there's nothing wrong with wanting to monetize on your platform, considering you are a stellar platform to use. Um, but how we do that and the swift choices we make often aren't the easiest ones that will create the most harmony in the people that are using your products either. So I, I look forward to, if, if Unity is open to it, I look forward to helping them craft that story and that conversation so that it can really meet the needs of everyone. Jeremy, just for any listeners who aren't up to speed on what's happening um, with the Unity, um, I saw it's quoted as a debacle earlier. Could you, could you just cast a little light on what's been happening? I think it largely, and Yolanda, you you said it so succinctly. I think the 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 main problem uh, boils down to communications, right? And very uh, rapid choices, probably driven by uh, financial challenges, right? From you know, because they, if you look at it long term, from a from a platform perspective, they haven't done really well financially right over the long term um so there probably was a moment where they're like man we got to figure out how to generate some revenue then it was it's seemingly i don't want to call it a knee jerk i'm not in this at all i'm just reading it peripherally right. but assuming that you know it basically was like hey all right we got to do this and then start charging for certain aspects of the platform where it used to be free and developers have basically put tons of time and energy into building on that platform. And now it's like, wait a minute. So the financial metrics are going to change. So then they came back and went for it's communication is the biggest challenge. Right. And it's like, yeah. it's the first technology, right? Communication is our first technology We start with letters and talking and stories and songs and all of that, but we still haven't quite figured that out. <laughs> so that's my understanding of, it. but let's, let's, let's push that aside. I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but I definitely wanted to touch on it. Yolanda, I, I want to hear more about this, this experience that you're building, but I also want to hear about, um, I want to move into kind of the inclusion topic, right? So accessibility, the technology, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. And let's talk about some of the work that you're doing to make sure um, it is accessible to all the people that want to create and use it. Can I just go back to your first question there? Because I'm really, just so we know, could you walk us through the experience? So then when we're, if we're open, then we're going to talk about the access accessibility, what that might mean for people, what they can expect just from a, a visitor and a developer perspective. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk. I mean, accessibility, like we are paving over rich history on a daily basis in our like race to build the latest and greatest, whether that's buildings or technology, we are constantly paving over profound memories in geographic spaces. So what does it mean to preserve that history prior to building over it, right? That makes it accessible because in our race to create it, we're losing access to history. We're losing access to memories. And these are the things that have inspired us and shaped our overall human essence of where we're going, who we are, who we wanna be, and honestly, who we don't wanna be too. And so we want to create access and emerging technology can be a bridge for that access. But I want access to be able to teleport to moments in history that we no longer can experience. So for you, Mark, like who doesn't want to see what the early days of the Beatles looked like in Liverpool, right? Or for Jeremy, what, what does it look like for us to be able to have John Lewis and Dr. Martin Luther King teach us the civil rights movement and emerging technology where we can be front row seat? right here in Atlanta. And yeah. just because Mark's in London, he should still be able to access that history in Atlanta as well. So what would that look like if our stories were connecting us, if they were the bridges for what we want to create in our own personal story and the story of humanity? Um, and so where I think we're going wrong is the word inclusion has become so oversaturated that it's just an objective that everyone puts on their website or their social media or their mission and their values. Like, let's weave that that thread right on into what we're saying, but real inclusion requires access. 
and it requires action. And so if we were taking a different approach to technology's ability, if we really want to innovate, then that innovation has to be a direct reflection of how diverse our team is because the power of inclusion and diverse perspectives really do fuel that innovation and that disruption. So we need all those voices. We need that lived experience from a variety of cultures and people and places. And that's gonna lead to better solutions that really serve the larger spectrum of humanity. So, you know, I'm not trying to bang and, and bag on all the technology companies right now, but you move so quickly that you're not really paying attention to how your technology can be introduced to people beyond those that look like you in the spaces that you are used to being in, in the conversations you're used to having. Like, honestly, if every day you're talking to the same people in the same spaces, if every um, thing that you're doing is surrounded by people that all look like you, I don't care what you put in your mission and values, it's not inclusive. And what it really looks like and what we focus on in our team is how to involve, evolve into a real hub of collaboration where engineers and designers and programmers and artists and creators from a myriad of backgrounds converge to create solutions that are gonna resonate with everyone and really like the whole spectrum of humanity. And so it's really not about ticking boxes. It's not, it's the team has to mirror the world in order for us to create and design technology for everyone. And this concept is not just limited to tech, right? It's it's not a vessel unto, or it's, it is a vessel and it's not an entity unto itself. It's This is a way we can craft a new reality where we all can participate. And I think we're moving really quickly ahead without plugging in other people, other cultures, other spaces into that technology that really can lead us to the future that we want to get to. Is it like a, an elitist problem in emerging tech? I think it's clear. Is it how, okay, how do we make that vision or how are you making that vi vision a reality, Yolanda? What, what, are the, what are you doing and what can we do? Yeah, you know, it's, what I can say is I think the culture of tech has been um, kind of siloed. And so what do we do to open up that space to more people, right? I'm currently writing a book now called Unapologetic Tech. And what it means is that, like, I don't come from a, a traditional tech background. Does that mean I don't belong? And that's something that I'm always being told. That's not what tech is for, Yolanda. And you don't have any official tech training. So what's your role in this industry? Well, I have vision and I have purpose and I have the desire to use technology to connect us and bridge divides, the divide between generations, the divide between communities that do not have access to tech and large tech companies. There's a lot of divides to bridge. And so at Revere, we feel like we can just be an example. So let's show you what it means to go city to city, country to country, and preserve history and make it accessible to everyone so that you can experience and have access to history. Whether it belongs to you or not, it's an opportunity to shape your story and to experience someone else's. And it's an uncharted realm where technology and humanity intertwine in ways that I believe are unapologetically transformative. And I'm welcoming you all to the world of unapologetic tech. That sounds like a fascinating um, philosophy. And, and Reed, you have to keep us posted when when, yeah, when, when, that gets when put can out. we read that? It's a it's an awesome title as well. It's Thank great. you so much. Coming soon. There you go. Not yeah. All right. Cool. We'll stay on that. Um, so I want to I want to point. I, I want to kind of talk about a couple of things that you said. Number one, um, you know, being in tech circles because I, I I am as well. Um, you know, I'm not a developer, you know, I'm not a, you know, I'm not an architect, but, you know, I am someone who understands the pieces and parts of technology, but also to apply them on to meaningful use cases. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I totally hear what you're saying. Cause I get in some circles too, where I don't quite fit square peg round hole. Right. Yeah. Um, but the, the important thing is like tech for tech's sake really isn't anything, but applied tech to human purpose is kind of where it is. And it sounds like that's one of the, one of the superpowers that that emerge out of your wheelhouse. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. I mean, I think it's really approaching a new philosophy, right? So how do we create an opportunity for poets to collaborate with programmers? How do we take the expertise of coders and um, combine that with insights from caregivers and teachers and artists and elders and visionaries? How does a coder in Mumbai work with an AI um, artist in Tokyo. Like, this is what the new landscape of tech needs to look like because, 
like in the vast expanse of like binary codes, there is room for stories. There's room for laughter. There's room for tears. There's room for our dreams and our greatest aspirations. And I think this is the next level for tech to approach. Like if you really want these digital worlds to take off and be something different than the world that we exist in now with all these divisions, if you want to create a way for that to be a path for the true power of human essence and inclusion, we need to plug more people in. We need to make it the norm to see people that look different and think different and approach things differently and have different backgrounds and lived experiences to really be able to become leaders in tech. And I'm ready for tech to really welcome that and accept that new reality. On on the accessibility side, let's let's uh, drop back there a little bit because it's this is this is a, a, a multi headed monster from a problem perspective, right? So if I look at all of that, I see, you know, the 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 consumer side hardware as a piece of that, mm -hmm. but you also look at like things like internet connection, internet availability. Uh, yeah. to that as well. Just two of the things to 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 kind of consider. How how are you? How have you found as you land in these geographies and kind of work on some of that stuff? Are you involved in kind of uh, stoking the fires on on available availability to to internet kind of stuff too? Um, I wouldn't say that that's our only priority. But one thing that I think is okay. So for VR headsets amazing technology, right? And they're starting to consider what it means to put it on different people's heads with different backgrounds. Like, can it fit over my hair? Can we start there, right? And so I'm looking at that and saying, that's still something that's growing. Like not every household is gonna have access to a VR headset, but everyone has access to a phone. And how can we be using AR to create footprints through every city that allow us to experience history and to engage with legacies and elders and lived experience that can give us more access as well. You know, um, my CTO, uh, uh, Curling Robinson, was one of the founders of Net Zero, like wanting to make internet accessible to everyone. And you've got great programs in schools that are supporting low-income families to have free internet so that they have access. I mean, it's just an example of what it really means to bring people along with us because some of those youth that come from those homes now that they have access to internet, they're gonna be able to create solutions years from now that are going to continue to push the future of tech. So the sooner we plug people in and the sooner we make it accessible to communities that don't traditionally have access, the further we're gonna go. And so um, in my early days, prior to building Revere XR, I used to host events and I just call them plug-in events. Anyone come in and put a headset on, an elder, high school students, um, people in art, people in aviation, like let's actually get you plugged in so you can consider the possibilities. And one thing that I can say is every time we do plug someone in, you can see the wheels turning. You can see the shift happening. People are inspired and they immediately say, I can see this working in schools or I can see this, like the ideas come. So it's, there's no shortage of ideas. There's no shortage of people that want to explore the possibilities. We just need to create more opportunities where we're showing more um, action and ambition in bringing these voices to the table. And maybe we we need less tables with less seats. Maybe we need more microphones so that people can use their voices and share their stories. And that's what people really need to hear. And people will value them. Like we all value each other's lived experience. There is empathy and emotional connection that exists within us. So why is it so unheard of? to use technology in this way? And why is that something that people are still pondering on or considering? Like we have arrived, it's time to create that. Do you, that is maybe not a question for right now, but internet access is a human right, free internet access to everybody. Is that something which isn't too far off or is something we should be aiming for before, before a lot of other things that we seem to be focusing on? I feel like that should absolutely be the norm without saying, I mean, there really shouldn't be any situation where we're still contemplating that everyone needs access, all of us. Every, And I look at that and say, it's not just my neighborhood that had history to preserve. Like every neighborhood, every community, every city, every country, every family, every company, everyone has a story. So what does it mean to make that accessible and allow people to experience it or interact with it or engage with it? 
um, that experiential learning is what's going to shape the future of, of education. It's going to shape the future of our connection. And that should be taking place in libraries and malls and museums and airports. And, and those are places we're looking to bring this, this uh, relived history experiential experiences. Yeah, one one quick thought on that. So even even taking it a step back. So I've been for those who've been listening for the last few weeks, I've been talking about a book I've been reading called The High Frontier that was mm -hmm. written back in like 1976 by the same physicist from Princeton that basically developed storage rings for particle colliders. Basically mm -hmm. a massive invention that everyone uses to this day, but he had this idea and he said that we had the tech to uh to live in space in communities in space in 1976 and really interesting but one thing he pointed back to was a an economic equation and the economic equation was uh access to power uh is 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 correlated to uh to wealth or the potential for um obtaining wealth right so like if you don't have power you can't really there's a lot of things that you can't do right so there's that piece of the puzzle there's still a lot of places that don't have reliable power but then yeah. this in this economy and where we're headed you're absolutely right like the internet access has to has to kind of happen to to allow people the opportunity just the opportunity to try mm -hmm. and pull something off it's not going to guarantee anything but hey they're they're pulling up to the race as well right yeah it's it's part of acknowledging that it's not just for a few it's for all of us. And there are spaces where amazing talent like Zuckerberg comes um, out of Harvard and shapes a new world for us to consider ways to connect. Well, there are people in different spaces waiting for those same opportunities. There's people in different spaces who deserve those same opportunities. So it's just, we kind of have to make a pledge and acknowledge this isn't for a few, it's for all of us. Uh, much of what you're talking about isn't isn't history either it's heritage and culture it's modern day of the moment yeah. sto storytelling as well yeah, and I, like how how do you i mean you started speaking with about hendrix and seattle and building this immersive experience for on seattle um how, how do you balance between history and then also so i'm i'm living in france so i want to go to the french revolution okay and there's nobody yeah. around who was there who yeah. can tell us what it's like where there are still people who are around during the 60s who can tell us about Hendrix for example mm -hmm. like how do you those three different immersive experience ancient history recent history and modern day storytelling how do you mm -hmm. juggle those three concepts yeah in sorry, a, that's a big question sorry I didn't... <laughs> no I've got a simple answer um and it's a two-word answer that we created during my grad school, XR preservation. It's and let's use XR and extend to all of us an opportunity, a chance to be a part of something greater than ourselves. And that means we deserve the opportunity to experience history. We deserve the opportunity to experience our current moments. We deserve the opportunity to um, consider what that looks like to shape, recreate, and reimagine um, the past well into the future. So we can be like guardians of the moments and the keepers of history that deserve to be remembered. And I feel like XR preservation is the answer. And I know it's not every investor's dream to have something new in this way that isn't specifically related to a metrics, but it's going to take visions beyond that to really shape the future. And we are building the future right now. So what role do people want to play? Do you want to be a spectator? Do you want to be a creator? Do you want to be a consumer? Do you want to be a producer? Like, what role are you going to play? And for me, I decided, I know I don't come from this space. Not, not too many people look like me, talk like me, think like me in this space. And I'm not traditional to tech, but I believe that XR preservation is something that can unite us around the world, like globally, around our heritage, around moments that we need to relive. And I also think the lack of history and connection is a direct reflection of some of the mistakes that we're about to start making. Like we're about to relive uh, some of the very mistakes that we've already um, fought to move past in history. And we don't have those reminders of history to remind us of who we don't wanna be. 
So what kind of mistakes are we looking at recreating by not reliving the lessons that were already learned generations before us? And so it's it really is bridging the past with the future, the different generations all together in one. And people who really, you know, there's a large group of people who aren't plugging into games yet. Like, don't get me wrong. Gaming has been exceptional. It's an amazing industry. It's technically how I got plugged in, too. But people will also be captivated by immersive and emerging tech if we can open up the floodgates of culture and heritage, of music history, of lived experience. And that's going to bring in the storytellers, the historians, the poets, the cultured community who love art history. And we can really, that's already being proven, like you saw how Van Gogh did. You know, it, people are waiting to experience tech on a social profound, exciting, impactful level beyond what we're doing now. And that doesn't mean to shame the work that's being done. It means, can we keep going? Can we yeah, keep you, going? Yeah, absolutely. Just to, just to chime in real quick. So like, I think you hit the nail on the head with like, people want to, um, they don't want to be necessarily isolated in a headset. Like these yeah. room-based experiences, mm -hmm. like the Illuminarium and a bunch of others are like super cool where all of us could go like a hundred people could go in there and be immersed in this kind of thing. So that's, that's one point I want to, I want to hit two others that you sparked something in my brain on um, nice. whenever, whenever you're building something new mm -hmm. and you're funded by, by, a, by an investor and, and that investor is looking for what are the KPIs of my participation in this? Right. Mm -hmm. And this is just a, what if I, I love throwing out kind of what ifs. So, what you're what you're doing is capturing historical moments number one so there's a capture part of it yeah. but would you say after the capture you're almost elevating the potential for uh, a heightened limbic connection meaning an mm -hmm. emotional connection to what that experience was instead of flipping through encyclopedia britannica it's kind of like what what the center for uh civil and human rights did in atlanta with the with the lunch top counter right where you put on this the this headset and you actually hear like you jump and you hear people shouting at you saying you're not allowed to be in the same place they are you're finally being able to experience that right so yeah. while, I'm going to wrap this up real quick so the long story short is what if the KPI to an experience was the potential for pattern breaking and if there was a way to somehow quantify that where someone who didn't understand what it felt like to yeah. sit at the lunch counter at the end of that experience going, damn, I was wrong and I need to learn a little bit more about this, right? What do you think yeah. about all that? I think that is the power of XR preservation. Like, what does it mean to have immersive stories, to have interactive storytelling? What does it mean to engage and experience it? So what if you could experience what Rosa Parks experienced? It might shape a new reality for you. So like this is the opportunity for us to open our minds and experience things beyond just talking about them and sharing our perspectives. Like let's put some lived experience to that perspective and now consider how it impacts us. And, and we can do that through experiencing. Like I look at students, right? Listen, when you and I were in school, it was very different than what it is now. And most of these students don't have the same attention span. Right. And some of these books have also been written from perspectives that don't really represent the real story. So they're mischaracterized stories. My 17 year old daughter. If the books out, are even if the books are even in school still. But that's a whole nother. That's a whole nother. <laughs> I have to tell you. So we're, my, not, we're not there. Are we, Jeremy? No, my 17 year old and my 13 year old play a huge role in the company. And my my oldest daughter said in the superintendent's office, you know, this is really only the, the only way to have unbiased education because we're experiencing it as opposed to hearing it from one person's perspective. And I thought, I wish I had came up with that. That's impactful. brilliant. Right. So if students can now live history, they can interact with it. They can sit that Civil War front row seat and they can experience it for themselves. How much more profound is that? And we already feel like there's this disconnection between humanity with how we're kind of allowing students and youth. Like they, the phone is something that is very much a part of who they are, like electronics and like using technology to interact and communicate with each other is very much who they are. But are they losing a sense of identity that you and I were able to create by, by just playing outside and playing with people more one-on-one? -on -one? Well, this is one way we can recreate that. So they may not all be sitting at the table with an elder or on the porch with a grandparent who's telling them stories. That's not as accessible as it was to like you and I, 
right? But now if they can live history, if they can put on a headset and experience it, if they can do a tour of a specific neighborhood with their phone and have storytellers on different corners sharing that history with them, that's going to reconnect them to a legacy and create inspiration for only what we can imagine. And I think that's the most impactful part of this and why we're focusing on XR preservation and preserving history. One of my, not my biggest regrets, but so when I was, when I was 14 in England, in the English education system, essentially I, ha I had to choose between history and, and, and geography. And I chose geography uh, mostly because my history teacher looked like she was from the middle ages and like didn't really, that was going too far back. And, <laughs> And obviously now, like I, I wish that I'd taken history because I think as you get older, it's vastly more fascinating, but also vastly more difficult to access than like geography, human or physical. I think that history, once you miss that boat when you're young, it's very difficult to catch yeah. up, um, very time consuming, very um, cerebral input, a lot of brain, in brain input, these mm -hmm. long day. Um, which talks back to Jeremy's observation about KPIs and Unfortunately, KPIs need to be monetized unless this is coming through a governmental KPI. Like, or like, I just I don't know if business corporations and investing is the way to make this accessible because there, where's the monetization? So, if we can make the local and national and international government interested in it and give them the KPIs of what they're going to get, that would be a more beneficial or successful route or to market and it's not to market it's to culture so <laughs> what do you think that wasn't really a question that's okay but i'm willing to give my perspective i mean i think that we're used to considering um innovation on one level and we don't consider that impactful social good technology can be monetized and it can wouldn't if you could download a immersive experience about Jimi hendrix wouldn't you if you, oh, yeah. Could, yeah, if I could uh, preserve all of the amazing history and stories that were lost due to the Holocaust, wouldn't Jewish people want to be able to access their history in that way too? Like, wouldn't we want to be able to relive sports, most exciting moments way beyond 2D? It can be monetized and it can be something that we work with school districts and we're interested in putting kiosks in airports so that no matter what city you are in, you can experience history while you're waiting for your flight. Now that changes the reality for your trip to the airport. Maybe you won't mind going Ooh, through yeah. security earlier so that you can plug in and experience some history before you get on that plane. There really are opportunities for that. And Revere XR is really looking forward to showing the world what that looks like. I love that idea of having a history lesson in whatever airport that you happen to be doing a stopover in or train station or wherever you are. It's like, where am I? Oh, I know. And then you learn something yeah. incredible about it. Well, well, you think about, so so talking about ways to support missions like this are certainly grant-based or certainly educational, you know, governmental kind of stuff. But like if you have global, like a global corporation that is activated in, you know, multiple geographies, you know, what if, you know, the, I mean, how impactful would it be, you know, to give Mark, like, you know, as someone who lives where he does uh, a complete, like if he goes to visit, you know, Birmingham, Alabama, instead of Birmingham, right. England, where you're from, right? You don't live there now. Like, what if you're able to experience that, the history of that um, through, through XR, right? Versus just saying, hey, Mark, yeah, some stuff happened down there. It was a little crazy. Uh, but you know, you, I think your, your empathy would be, uh, catalyzed in a, in a way that wasn't possible before. Companies yeah, no, might It's definitely going to take the right kind of investor. I mean, I, I'm always reminded by everyone, well, how are you going to do this when black women get such a small percentage of investment? You know what? It's just the right investor. It's just the right company that wants to see us connect in that way. And they're out there. Like we have a vision, we have a blueprint, we have a team. And in every day we're working towards manifesting that by bringing it to people that want to see this reality. You know, what does it look like for Mark to experience a culture in Asia or for you to experience an amazing culture in Jamaica? It gives us an opportunity 
for us to really have a sense of empathy. It recreates a stronger sense of emotional connection because we can experience what other people live. The problem is everybody's stuck in their own experience. And, and some of us assume that that's how everyone lives and it's not. And how can we let history and culture and heritage reshape that perspective and have a whole new sense of valuing one another. And it can create an amazing new economy for every city to simulate history for your residents, for tourists, for museums, for schools, for malls, for airports. Like this is an amazing opportunity. And so we want to see Meta take advantage of, of t using their technology and the roadmap that they've created and, uh, and supporting companies like us who want to like push that boundary beyond what they've even considered. And Google really shows a lot of um, appreciation for things like this. I see with the funding they're doing for other companies. So we just want to create the opportunity for people like Microsoft and Google and the Melinda Gates Foundation and Meta and even the Paul Allen Foundation. Like these are all stories that I think can really impact our human experience. And I do believe that people want to see that happen and people will respond. Yeah. I think Google has a, a VR. They're doing a, a virtual reality of some of the biggest and not biggest uh, museums in the world. They have a whole program dedicated to that, don't they? To like fit, uh, digital twins of museums. Yeah. Well, then some of the, that also reminds me of the access issue that was there prior to the digital world. So what, what are we not including if we're only focusing in some spaces? Because not all of those spaces house stories and legacies that still needed to be preserved. So this is kind of bringing it all to the table. Absolutely. Um, so question for, I, I want, I have one last question and I, and I want to hear about like what the rest of the year looks like for you and mm -hmm. Revere and this, this experience that you're building and launching and, and like take us into uh, kind of the ramp and, and where people can find and see all of this stuff down the road. Um, one question related to, and we hinted on this a little bit ago, which do you think is going to have more impact individual headsets or room-based experiences where multiple people can can come in and and you know participate as as a group of other humans physically. Yeah, I think the social spaces where we can remove the headset is going to be really impactful for some groups of people. Now, if you're a gamer, um, that can be impactful too. But a lot of people do like the opportunity to plug in and kind of separate from the real world, and so we respect that. And we there are times that I need that too. Like, listen, sometime Friday I'm going to be playing Beat Saber, um, <laughs> and it's going to be a great way to decompress after my week. But more than anything, like we want to be able to go to an exhibit where we can experience physical artifacts and immersive spaces, so we can. Like, I'd love to see Jimi Hendrix wardrobe, but I'd also like to go to an interactive, recreated holographic concert, right? And what does it look like to do that in a social space where we can all enjoy that? That's the future that I think we're really looking forward to creating. And it's going to take some time. And I think we'll continue to shape that the more we plug larger groups of people in who can bring their ideas and, and those social experiences to the table. Um, as far as us, we just created an amazing partnership with Niantic. We're going to be premiering a really cool AR project um, later in March at their GTC conference. And we're currently doing hackathons um, while we're preserving history in Seattle and Atlanta. So we're, we're plugging youth in um, through our immersive storytelling certification program and allowing them to learn to recreate history both in VR and AR for their city so that they can preserve their history and their cities and their communities and the music that's taken place. And so we're doing a hackathon in Atlanta and another one in Seattle that's part youth, part um, developer coder. And we're gonna be teaching them things and building some amazing things in VR and AR um, and we're fundraising. Very cool. Very, when, when do you think, so the Niantic experience is gonna be out in, in March. It'll be pushed out at their conference in March and then available for other people to check out or? Yes, but that's NVIDIA by the way. <laughs> oh, NVIDIA. oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. Um, great. That, that sounds awesome. I, I, you know, I, lo I love the work that you're doing. I love the mission that you have. You certainly have a, an infectious passion about solving these big and complicated problems, but also doing them, not just talking about them. Cause there are a lot of people that, that live in the world of talk, but you're actually pulling these down into executable things that, 
that will uh, will make a difference uh, step by step and hopefully aggregate into something amazing. So congrats to all the time Thank and effort and energy you're you're putting on there. I think it's awesome. Thank you so much. And I look forward to plugging you both in very soon. I'm just going to a little obs something that I, my mind went to speaking just in the last five minutes was um, I, just, I started thinking about the news and documentaries and maybe this is my, my British TV history coming out, but we, we have a lot of news and documentary. And I was thinking this kind of immersive experience, this storytelling would be very powerful in a, in a factual news environment whereby mm. i mean I, I, just an example like there's a lot in the uk press or there was last year about the windrush generation and not not many people know about the windrush generation but it's, they hear about it all the time so mm. this kind of tech could add so many layers of yeah. empathy which we spoke about but a, a knowledge of understanding of these stories which mm. we talk about very often in in the news and in documentaries so i'm going to think some more on that and how that could work um how was tedx what was that experience like quickly oh wow it was incredible it was such an amazing experience um i'm hooked i'm still buzzing from it it was incredible to walk into a space where people want to hear your big ideas and they're there for that reason and they're willing to take let you take them on a journey um so it was it was incredible and shout outs to mode x and tasha white for putting that together. She brought some amazing speakers together and I got just as much out of it listening to the other people too. How, how, how was the, did it feel like a pressured environment for you? Obviously you're on stage at a TEDx, so there's pressure or was it quite rigid or was it relaxed kind of like, don't see you Yolanda under, under any your... pressure <laughs> in talking about this kind of oh, stuff. No, don't, don't, <laughs> don't mistake. Listen, leading up to any speaking engagement sometimes is very challenging for me. Like having these conversations is great, but speaking in front of large audiences while I do it quite a bit and I love it at the end of it, it's very, <laughs> it's very, it's a lot of pressure um, initially. And because it was TEDx, it was 10 times more pressure. But what's interesting is when I got there, it actually felt like I was just having a conversation among friends. And so some of that is just me imposing stress on myself, but um, the environment was not rigid. Tasha really poured into us and reminded us that she chose us for a reason and that TEDx wanted to hear our ideas and that we were at the right place at the right time with the right energy and the right solution. And that was what we all really needed. Um, I definitely was nervous. When, and when is it out? When can we see it? Uh, that I'd like to know that too. It, it's going to take some time. I mean, um, I think TEDx has to go through their process and then they'll uh, promote it and, and post it. So we look forward to that also. So I'll keep you guys posted on when it's available because it's definitely going to be a ride. <laughs> Amazing. We'll keep a lookout for that and your book uh, coming up very soon. Uh, mm -hmm. You're working on that. Uh, Revere xr.com is where you can find more about yolanda's work we'll post a whole write-up with some fun notes and links that mark is really great at doing thinking on paper.xyz is where you can see where all the other disruptors and curious minds are coming to understand tech and it, in its place in human society and culture um, we're thankful to be able to do a little bit of the job of kind of investigating and helping unpack that kind of stuff so thanks for listening all of this stuff is on spotify uh, YouTube as well. And uh, quick thanks again to Ripple with a W, uh, W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com, marketing's on-demand talent platform, been a great uh, partner of ours for the last uh, couple of months. If you're looking for marketing superpowers, they're a great place to go. P.S. You can also find Mark Fielding and myself should you need our superpowers. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yolanda, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us again today. No problem. Take it easy. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.